One year ago, an elderly man and a young woman were found on a bench, barely conscious, in Salisbury in England. Now, the pair was later identified as Sergei Skripal, a former Russian spy, and his daughter, Yulia Skripal. They had been poisoned by a nerve agent known as Novichok, a chemical that paralyzes muscles, including those in the heart and the ones needed for breathing. Now, the chemical was manufactured in Russia in the 1980s, but this was the first time that the chemical agent was used in Europe and all fingers pointed at Russia. Now, who else was affected by this attack? Detective Sergeant Nick Haley, who attended to the Skripals, was, was also poisoned. And although he survived, he lost his home, his car, and his possessions. He was allegedly compensated for this loss. He resumed his post in early 2019. Now, months after the first poisoning, which happened in March 2018, Charlie Rowley and his partner Dawn Stages, a mother of three, also came in contact with a perfume bottle used for the poison attack. They found the bottle in a bin, which had a modified nozzle. Now, Charlie tried to put it together, and Dawn sprayed the contents on her wrists. Dawn succumbed to the poison while Charlie survived. UK officials claimed Russia was behind the attack. One, because of the chemical element, as was supported by findings from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. But more compelling was the CCTV footage showing the two suspects, Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Boshirov, walking around Salisbury. Here's what UK Prime Minister Theresa May said. It is now clear that Mr Skripal and his daughter were poisoned with a military-grade nerve agent of a type developed by Russia. This is part of a group of nerve agents known as Novichok. Based on the positive identification of this chemical agent by world-leading experts at the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory at Porton Down, our knowledge that Russia has previously produced this agent and would still be capable of doing so, Russia's record of conducting state-sponsored assassinations, and our assessment that Russia v views some defectors as legitimate targets for assassinations, the government has concluded that it is highly likely that Russia was responsible for the act against Sergei and Yulia Skripal. Now, the two suspects were later identified by Bellingcat, an investigative agency, Dr. Alexander Mishkin, and as Colonel Anatoly Chepiga, two members of the GRU. Those names have since been confirmed by British officials, and just recently they have released the alias of a third suspect. Now, Russia has, of course, denied these claims, and Putin actually responded. Мы все наше химическое оружие уничтожили под контролем международных наблюдателей. Причем сделали это первыми, в отличие от некоторых наших партнеров, которые обещали это сделать, но своих обязательств до сих пор, к сожалению, не сдержали. But why would Russia use Novichok poison if it could be traced back to them? On the show today, I have Michael Kaufman, a fellow at the Canaan Institute, Woodrow Wilson International Center in Washington. Now, his work focuses on security issues in Russia and the former Soviet Union. Welcome very much, Michael Kaufman, to this show. Could you begin by explaining to us why would Russia, knowing that this poison would be traced back to them, use it for a former Russian spy? They did it so that it could be traced back to them. I mean, the whole idea of that attack was as a demonstration. And the poison they chose was both meant to be a spectacular form of attack, similar to the case of Litvinenko back in 2006, who was poisoned with polonium, a radioactive substance. And it was done intentionally such that people would know that the Russians did it 
and that they would understand um, why they did it, potentially, or at least suspect. Uh, and it added dual nature to it. One, of course, to poison and kill Skripal and send a message to other former Russian spies and agents um, and various uh, sort of enemies of the Russian regime that many of which take up residence in London. And another one, naturally, to the British government, that there are consequences to the British government for harboring these individuals. Now, a bit of background on uh, Skripal. In 2004, December, he was arrested by federal uh, security service agents on suspicion of mm -hmm. treason. He had been a double agent sharing Russian secrets with the MI6, that is the British military intelligence, for almost a decade. Now, in 2006, he was sentenced to 13 years in prison. But he did not have his full sentence. In 2010, at one of the biggest and prominent spy swap in decades, Russia and the U.S. agreed to swap 10 Russian sleepers, that's agents who haven't been activated, with four prisoners that Russia had accused of being double agents. Now, this was done in Austria, but one of the prisoners, that is Sergei Skripal, ended up in the U.K., and he led a pretty quiet life until this poisoning. Is there something that we are missing, Michael? Yeah, he didn't lead a pretty quiet life. Like Litvinenko, many people suspect that he was flying around and he was working with British intelligence to help him identify uh, Russian, Russian connections to organized crime, which is what Litvinenko was doing to help British intelligence and Spanish uh, security services identify flows of money and linkages between Russian organizations and um, Russian organized crime where they were parking their money in Spain. Many people suspect that Skripal was doing the same thing. And it's important to understand that Russia as a country runs off of informal rules in patronage networks, right? And the way people know that somebody has broken a rule and rules are unstated, they're not written down anywhere per se, is by things that happen to them, right? Uh, and what happened in the case of Skripal is that R Russia intelligence typically does not necessarily go after people that they've traded back. A spy swap is a spy swap, right? But in their minds, there's an, some inherent understanding or rule that Skripal was supposed to retire and live out a quiet life in the UK, and quite possibly he was not doing that. And the reason they, they conducted such a public attack was to send a signal to, one, anybody in Russia who would be interested in betraying Russian intelligence to suggest to them that um, you're not going to be traded back to a comfortable life in the UK, right? You might actually be killed. And, and two to make a clear note to other people who have been traded back in previous swaps that these are the consequences if you continue basically cooperating with foreign intelligence even after you're traded. Uh, but the fact that the poison that was used, the Novichok, is said to be more powerful than the VX, for example, would it be enough then to just give a hint of what could happen? or? Why, why weren't they killed by this poison if it's experts who are, who are working with it? Uh, well, one, said to be, it's phenomenal how many things are said to be um, by British security that has never had or handled Novichok. But here's the truth. Um, there are many different kinds of Novichok. And with this kind of chemical weapons are actually pretty difficult to apply and use. One of the big challenges with chemical weapons, why people tend not to use them in general, is because they're pretty difficult to use. Um, they're not necessarily all that effective, and you can easily make a mistake in how you mix and put it together. From what I understand in this case, the, uh, the nerve agent they were using, they mixed it and they applied it to a surface, and it's quite likely that the individuals involved, um, thankfully for Skripal, didn't mix it correctly, didn't apply it correctly. Um, and that's why it didn't kill Skripal ultimately instead. I mean, it, it would have, probably, if emergency services were not called to find him on that bench. Here's the truth. There's a fair chance he might have died um, together uh, uh, to get his daughter, but uh, quite quite likely they botched the operation, and that's the, that's the shortest. It. No, not intentionally. Unintentionally. <laughs> unintentionally. Quite likely they botched the operation. It's not as simple to use as it may sound, um, and and the truth of it is that it's also very possible that they smuggled it in to the UK as a series of uh, binary agents that they had to mix together. And that they didn't do it correctly. I mean, that's the yeah, you know, that's the that's the most straightforward and the most likely answer in this scenario. Um, as to how toxic and poisonous it is, well, some are and some are not. That's not necessarily the case. This is a type of nerve agent of which there are many different variants. So 
uh, British security services may have well overstated their case. Um, is killing or targeting enemy, enemies in foreign countries part of Russia's security policy? Yeah, it is. It absolutely and who is. Makes, who makes the decision that such and such person is our target? Is it, who is it, in the government? Is it in the military? So decisions on these kind of uh, covert actions that involve target assassination are ultimately approved at the very top of the state by the president and the leader of Russia, who all knows Vladimir Putin and has been for 20 years. Are you claiming that Russia is behind the attack? I think everyone's claimed that. I mean, we're a year down the line. I, I think that I'm not sure there's anybody on earth that's not claiming Russia's behind the attack except for Russia. Now, the UK accusing Russia led to a diplomatic spot reminiscent of the Cold War. Scores of Russian diplomats were expelled from countries such as Britain, US, Germany, the Netherlands, and more. And Russia retaliated by expelling diplomats of all the countries that had expelled theirs. Mm -hmm. Now, we have said, or rather you have said, that Russia is the first um, person who is suspected or, or the state that is suspected of wanting to kill him. But who else? You have said that uh, Skripal had trips um, while he was expected to be a retired uh, spy. But who, so who else would have wanted to kill him? Skripal? I mean, British intelligence worked back effectively three GRU agents from Russia's main intelligence uh, directorate, basically the general staff. Two of them had entered the country and had conducted this operation the weekend went back. So it's not, I'll be frank, it's not really a mystery as to what happened, when it happened, who did it, or how they did it. These facts have been well established and pieced together. Um, so I'm not really sure kind of who else might have wanted to kill him, to be honest. That doesn't make too much sense to me. It's Pretty, pretty pretty clearly worked out case. Um, in fact, we not only know the intelligence agents who did it, but we know their background. We know their entire story. We know a whole host of facts as to um, their association with Russian military intelligence, the comedy that was their passport numbers, and the fact that all these intelligence agents are issued a, a similar series of passport numbers. Um, and their dossiers. There's actually very little, surprisingly very little that's known about this case. This is a very blunt force operation by the Russian state where they really did want people to know. I mean, they wanted to get caught. The whole point was to send a message. It was not meant to be a really a clandestine operation. Thank you very much for your time, Michael. Michael Kaufman is a fellow at the Kenan Institute. Woodrow Wilson International Center in Washington, D.C., and his work focuses on security issues in Russia and the former Soviet Union, specializing in defense and military analyses. Thank you so much for your time, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for having me on your program. That's it from me. Until next time, goodbye.